On this episode of This Week in Linux, we've got a jam-packed episode. In fact, so much so I might even need to break out one of the topics into a separate video so that I can cover it more thoroughly, but we'll see about that. We're going to be covering new releases from all kinds of different things, from apps, distros, and more, including the Linux kernel itself with version 5.8. And in the app news, we got releases from Firefox, of course, the big, awesome web browser, Jellyfin, the media center software, uh, more of a media server, but anyway, and Nano, which is a text editor from GNU. In distro news, we got new releases from Nitrix, Bunsen Lab Linux, and Gecko Linux. And we'll tackle the big security news for this week related to Grub2 called Boot Hole. All this and much more coming up on your weekly source for Linux GNU's. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean and by Bitwarden. If this is your first time to the show, welcome. And This Week in Linux is a weekly Linux news podcast, a part of the Destination Linux network. I'm Michael Snell, and this show will keep you up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, and I'll give you my take on the latest topics using my over 20 years experience as a Linux user. Before we get started this week, we're going to do a little bit of housekeeping. And since this show is so jam-packed this week, I'm going to be doing a rapid-fire housekeeping section. So first of all, DLN Game Night is coming at the end of the month. I'll tell you about what the actual date is on the next episode. But just so you know, Game Night is coming. And if you are not uh, familiar with what we do, basically it's just a collective of everybody, a part of the DLN community, joins to play some games, and we stream it live. So if you want to be a part of that, be sure to uh, check out the Destination Linux Network website where you can find information about that as well as the other podcasts that are on the network, including two other shows that I do. So go to destinationlinux.network to find out more about that. And also follow me on Twitter or Mastodon to keep up to date with the Linux things that I'm doing for this show, this channel, and even the DLN game night because I will be posting about that as well. So all that is done. Done with the housekeeping. Let's go to the show. Up first in the show this week is the latest release of the namesake of this show, and that is Linux Kernel 5.8 has been released. So this is not a huge update, but it is a lot of important stuff like bug fixes and things like that. So we're going to talk about the highlights. So we have some networking stuff, some driver fixes, and some architecture stuff related to ARM, x86, and PowerPC. First of all, there's some improvements to ButterFS. There's also some people calling it BetterFS, and even some people call it Butterfuss. I don't know why anybody would do that, but I looked at the Wikipedia about how to pronounce this one because someone complained about how I pronounced it, and turns out there is no actual pronunciation of ButterFS because there's all, all of them are accepted, even just saying the letters or whatever. So ButterFS is what I'm going for because it sounds fun and it's smooth like butter. Any, anyway, so <laughs> also support for Shadow Call Stack has been added for the ARM64 architecture, inline encryption support for the block layer, support for LZORLE compression has been added in the F2FS file system, InitRD memory boot option has been added for specifying initial RAM disk image. Also, there's a new buffer allocation API, which makes it easier to write XDP network drivers and a lot of other stuff. We're going to talk about now for some security stuff. We have uh, previous Spectre mitigations that were impacting AMD CPU are no longer impacting it because the mitigation wasn't for AMD and didn't need to be actually addressing AMD CPUs. So they have fixed that. So now this will be actually better, even better performant for AMD processors. Another mitigation has been added for special register buffer data sampling or SRBDS, aka crosstalk vulnerability. So this is this is a based way to solve a hardware vulnerability affecting certain Intel processors. Again, AMD users not affected. Uh, they've also improved some security for ARM64, which now supports branch target identification, or BTI, and also the shadow call stack. And we're going to move on to drivers now. The XFAT driver optimization improvements have been made and fixes have been made by Samsung. If you're not aware, um, XFAT is made by Microsoft, and they made their own kind of driver that was not very good. And even the kernel developer said it was not very good. So it takes a third party to fix XFAT, Microsoft's uh, own file system. Anyway, 
Also, support for Thunderbolt ARM, or USB 4.0, has been added, as well as some driver updates for USB Type-C. And also, let's talk about a little bit more about AMD, because there's been a lot of things ha happening specifically for AMD in this latest release. So they've introduced AMD Energy Driver, allows getting energy reports per socket, per core, on Zen and Zen 2 CPUs. It allows users to see their CPU power consumption per core, which is fantastic. And AMD Renoir, Ren 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 it's not Renoir, it's R-E-N-O-I-R, Renoir, Renoir? Probably not. CPU temperature monitoring has been added. Also, ACP audio support has been added as well. And AMD GPU trusted memory zone support has been added, including improving for AMD GPU thermal cutoffs, as well as many more things. And also, we have support uh, updates, improvements for Power 10 processor, which is not AMD, by the way, but Power 10 processor is not even out yet, which is really cool because they're having, this processor is not meant to be arriving until 2021, and it's already having support in the Linux kernel, which is fantastic. I love to see those kinds of things. So if you want to learn more about the latest release of 5.8 for the Linux kernel, you'll find a link in the show notes below. Up next in the show this week is Firefox 79 has been released. There's been a lot of improvements and stuff like that for this one, as well as some security enhancements improved to their built-in tracker blocker. It's the second iteration of their enhanced tracking protection feature, or ETP. They've also added a lot of uh, screen reader related things, which is really cool. So SVG label and description elements are now correctly exposed to assistive technology products like screen readers. And also the Firefox developer tools received significant fixes, including various screen reader tools are now accessible for the developer tools, which is awesome. They've also made a new password export feature, which makes it possible to export your saved passwords and logins to a CSV file, which you can then use to migrate to Bitwarden by going to bitwarden.com slash DLN. Yep. And also they've done some improvements to some more security things related to links on websites because there's this really weird thing that, you know, basically the web has been kind of cobbled together over the course of decades, creating some issues that have to be addressed. And one of those things is that some links have a referrer thing that can be taken over through JavaScript. And Firefox has added a, this new configuration for links called rel equals no opener. This being added to all links that have a target of underscore blank, which basically means open new window, open new tab, that kind of thing. And it's supposed to be like a new website rather than taking over their existing website so that when you click this link, it will take you to another place rather than tank taking you off your existing site. So a lot of people do use underscore blank, but that creates a potential problem of JavaScript issues. So essentially this means it prevents the linked websites from using JavaScript to take control over the referring window, which would be very bad. And this no, no opener is actually a best practice by web developers and stuff like that. So I've been using it for years and this has actually been on the Mozilla agenda for a couple of years as well, but they have fixed it, which is fantastic. There are also extensions for people who are using other, uh, other browsers and stuff like that to address it. So there's even extensions in Firefox still if people want to use those, but I really like the fact that it's built into the software now because it allows you to have automatically support for fixing this so you're not susceptible on any links in Firefox at this point. So that's awesome. If you are a web developer and not using no opener rel related stuff in, in the attribute inside of your links, you need to fix that as soon as possible. But for those who are using Firefox, at least you know it's added by default now. So that's awesome. If you learn more about Firefox 79, I have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest release of Jellyfin, which is 10.6. So if you're not aware, Jellyfin is an open source media streaming server. It's basically used to manage and stream movies and music and TV and TV shows and stuff like that from your own local copies and media. So it's really cool. It's kind of like a Plex alternative or a, a MB slash Kodi alternative and that sort of thing. And if you are familiar, Kodi is somewhat similar to this, but not exactly because Kodi is an entertainment media center versus a media server. So it is different. So Kodi is like a content aggregator, 
and it brings all your media t media together in a single interface like DVDs, live TV, streaming, and that kind of thing. Kodi itself is an all-in-one because you can manage everything from it, but it can also be used as a front end for other things. In this case, Jellyfin is a back-end server that allows you to host a database of all your media. So if you have multiple Kodi clients, you can have one centralized Jellyfin server to serve all of the data to those Kodi clients. And it also not is just for centralizing this stuff like that. You can also manage watch history, content voting, transcoding automatically so you can have your main computer be transcoding the files for smaller devices, for phones and tablets and that kind of thing to make it so it's easier to stream those things quickly and that sort of thing. It also has a bunch of other stuff as well. So Jellyfin is a pretty cool piece of software and this latest release has over 30 major improvements and a ton of fixes as well. More than over 400 uh, pull, or no, more than over 500 pull requests have been merged for the server and the web client. And one of the biggest features though is this thing called Sync Play, which allows for creation of rooms for sharing a viewing experience. And also basically they say there's no user limit to join as well. So it allows you to have everybody watching the same thing through, so you can share an experience of what you're watching and that sort of thing, So, which is a really cool idea. Uh, I've seen a, quite a few things that do that sort of stuff, but never on a media server level, so that's pretty cool. And there's also been a lot of other things and improvements to like the database model. They've actually rewritten it. They said they migrated uh, to an, in, an entity framework core. They were basing their system previously on a database operations used by like SQLite, uh, databases, XML files, and C Sharp code. They have migrated that to EF Core, which should bring faster database queries, support for multiple database engines, cleaner code, and significantly reduce memory usage, as well as the just improvements to the reliability of the database because they're using something that's not just a local uh, flats file type of database, more of a bigger style. And these databases are also going to be automatically migrated when you first launch the latest version of 10.6, which is pretty cool. They've also done some improvements for the performance and the transcoding and all kinds of stuff like that on the server side, as well as improvements on the web client because they have improved support for eBooks They've by adding EPUB reader based on EPUB.js. They're also working on more formats like CBZ or CBR in including PDF. So those will be added in the future. They also have some improvements to like the UI and design for different pieces of the thing, such as improving the detail screen and even overhauling the mobile music player interface, as well as a bunch of other stuff. If you want to check it out, Jellyfin is a pretty cool piece of software. It is a fork of a software called MB. MB used to be an open source project, but they decided to no longer be cool and decided to proprietary everything. And therefore they ruined their any interest I have in them stuff. And Jellyfin agreed with that and decided we're going to make our own based on what they used to have. And here we go with Jelly Jellyfin 10.6.0. I mean, they've actually had multiple releases, but this is the latest one. And I really like the fact that this exists. The name Jellyfin is really weird, and I don't know why it's called that. But the software is pretty cool. So if you want to learn more about it, I'll have a link to it in the show notes below. This episode of This Week in Linux is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean offers the simplest, most developer-friendly cloud platform. It's optimized make managing and scaling apps easy with an intuitive API, multiple storage options, integrated firewalls, load balancers, and more. And you can get all this plus access to their world-class customer support for as low as $5 per month. And if you're not sure what you want to use on their cloud system, they also have over 2,000 cloud agnostic tutorials to help you stay up to date with the latest open source software, languages, and frameworks. And you can use those to learn about what things you can try, or you could even do their one-click installs through their marketplace. If you don't have an idea, check that out. There's a bunch of different things in the marketplace. It is super awesome. And they're even they're so quick to set up. You can set up a Minecraft server. You could set up a Jitsi install. All of this within less than a minute. It's awesome. And you can get started on DigitalOcean with two months for free with a $100 credit. So go to do.co slash DLN to use that credit. And thanks again to DigitalOcean for sponsoring This Week in Linux. Up next in the show is take eight of this topic. So in the intro, I said that we may break out a topic or two. And I've decided that we're definitely going to do that because this is a too complicated of a topic. It's very, very complicated, and I want to be—I want to give it justice that it needs to give you the details. But 
in this show is not really the best place to do that, I suppose, because it is such a complex topic and we have so many topics to talk about anyway. So we're going to break it out into its own video later in the week. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't to be informed in the full scale of this topic, but we're going to cover it in a thousand foot overview right now for this episode. So Grub2 has, uh, has some vulnerabilities. They were found, and the first vulnerability was found by a security company, Eclipsium, Ellipsium, I'm not sure, discovered a vulnerability that they have named Boothole. So what Boothole does is essentially enable circumvention from hackers to be able to bypass the UEFI secure boot, secure boot mechanism. This essentially gives the total control of an operating system or hypervisor. Now, you may have seen something about secure boot and non-secure boot users. So some people have said that if you're not, you know, they've presented it as non-secure boot users don't have to worry about this vulnerability. And that is true. You're not impacted if you don't have secure boot. But that doesn't mean you're, you're, you don't have to worry about it because there's other vulnerabilities. And just not having secure boot in itself is a vulnerability. So in a way, you could argue that that's true. So... Yes, technically, if you saw people saying that not having secure boot means you don't have the problem, that is true, but there are other problems that you could have by not having secure boot. Moving on. So a hacker has to edit grub.cfg, which is a configuration file for boot hole. In order to do that, they have to have root privileges, but essentially what it's doing is causing a, boot, a buffer overflow in, during the bootloading process, which allows them to then insert malware payload. But the key point here is that it requires root privileges to do this. That means your system has to already be compromised in order to use this vulnerability. So this is not a way into a system. This is a way to dominate a system once you have got in. So if your computer or your desktop is not compromised at the moment, this is not a way to compromise it. It's a way to have total control over a system once you have compromised it. So... It's, it is a big deal. It is a really big problem, and it kind of gets worse in certain ways depending on what system you use and that kind of thing. But it's not super dire that some places have made it out to be because it's not a way to get into your system. It's a way, once you're already in and already have root privileges, to completely have control. But if you already have root privileges on a system, you pretty much already have control anyway. So it's more of a do whatever you want at this point if you have it. So at that, at that sense, it's not that big of a deal. But I do want to say, I mean, it is a big deal, but it's not a big deal, and some people have presented it. So, so again, see, this is how complicated it is. There's a lot of nuance to it, and we're not, we haven't even got to the full nuance of it. Like, for example, the fact that boot hole is not the only vulnerability that was found. That was the first one, and then Canonical was informed by it by the developers of Clipsium who found it, and from that, they found their own vulnerabilities, and in fact, seven of them were found in addition to Boot Hole. So it was a total of eight flaws related to Grub2, which is definitely problematic. And uh, on the good, the good side is that Canonical, as well as a bunch of other companies and projects, have worked together to fix these vulnerabilities, and that is awesome, but there's some still some issues with that those those patches being implemented and deployed. So that's why the extra video is necessary because it's a lot. It's a lot because it's not just boot hole. It's also the Grub to signing certificate signing stuff creates other issues. Though if you even if you fix this patch and deploy it, you still have other problems to fix with like firmware stuff and anyway we're gonna make a whole video about this to give you a full topic but for now that's what it is it's a vulnerability that is very problematic but at the same time is not a way to get into your system so you don't have to worry a super amount and there's really nothing you can do anyway right now so it's more of a you're fine to upgrade because most distros by the way People said don't update, don't update your system. That was true for the first couple days, 
because they didn't know about the follow-up problem until after people had started upgrading. And then once they had once they found this new problem, well, they took back the patches, which created this issue. So they're working on fixing that. So if you do update your system, you're probably fine, but you also probably won't get the patches. So that's why there's say that there's it's such a complicated topic. I'm gonna make a whole video about it, but just know be careful when you download things because there are people who might be putting payloads that allows them to affect your system in the in this case using this problem because if you download a live iso from somehow and then you boot it on the same machine it is technically possible to use that iso to then infect another system on the computer because of this secure boot vulnerability and yeah it's complicated Let's move on to the next topic that's related to this topic, which is equally complicated and will also be broken out into a video. However, I'll probably just combine the two into a single video. But yeah, let's move on. So next up is a topic that you may or may not have seen related to boot hole, saying that Red Hat system booting issues are happening because of boot hole, and even some saying that this system can't boot anymore and that kind of thing. So there's a couple things I wanted to clear up first here. Uh, one, it is technically true, but also there's some nuance. Of course there's nuance because this topic is just a monster. Anyway, so we have a thing about it's not exclusive to Red Hat. It also applies to Debian, Ubuntu, Fedora, well, Fedora, Red Hat, you know, whatever, and other things that have the same kind of problem with Secure Boot. So the, the fundamental issue here is that this problem was found after issuing the patches for Secure Boot or the boot hole grub2 issue. So this this problem vulnerability was fixed, but it also, in the fix, there was a side effect in that uh, Secure Boot's security authority, or CA, is actually Microsoft. And Microsoft decided to just kind of nuke it from orbit and kill all signatures of all previous versions of grub and all that stuff so Secure Boot wouldn't accept them anymore. Which, in a way, is kind of like a good idea, but at the same time creates its own problem. So it creates the problem that the old signature cannot boot, but the new signature needs to be updated in the firmware to get the new version of Grub booted. So if at in this period of time, which is a couple days, if you had upgraded your system, the certificate authority is looking for a signature that is not available from the new Grub2 because it has it has to be re-signed and make new signatures for it. And so it's basically there, it's the, the CA is saying that this certificate is not valid, therefore the system can't boot with this version of Grub. The old version of Grub signatures have been invalidated because of the vulnerability, creating this period of a roadblock where the system couldn't boot. Now, those issues have been rolled back for distributions that have experienced it. And that means that while you can update your system now, uh, you couldn't for a couple of days, but you can now, you're probably not going to get the update for Grub anyway. So it creates this kind of sort of limbo situation that where the Grub2 boot hole vulnerability patches exist and can be patched, they're not being deployed yet because of this side effect problem. So the good thing about that is it is being worked on. It will be fixed relatively soon, probably in a couple weeks or week or somewhere around there. I don't know. I don't know how long it takes. I'll just go ahead and put that out there. I don't know how long it takes to fix these kind of problems. They've known about the problem for a couple months before they announced the patches how they fix the vendor firmware issue certificate authority issue related to these patches i don't know how long that will take but i suspect it won't be that long because of how impactful important this is and how many companies are affected by it and how many people are looking at this problem to fix it so i don't know how long it will be but i don't think it'll be that long so just so you know when you update you're probably okay now you weren't a few days ago but you are now probably, depending on your distro and how adamant they are about making sure that this update has been addressed and the side effect has been addressed. I don't know. But when you do update now, it will not include this patch. 
So keep that in mind. You still might be affected by this patch. Maybe in the rare possibility that someone has already infected your machine or you download an ISO that has that or whatever. So it's not likely you'll be affected. It's a very small amount of possibility. But the patches have not been deployed yet. So just keep that in mind. Man, this is a complicated topic. I'm glad I decided to break it out into different sections and a whole other video and still it's like 15 minute long topic or it's over 10 minutes for sure i don't know how long it is but it's still a long topic even though i'm giving you the overview yeah so if you want to learn more about this topic i'll have links in the show notes but also be sure to subscribe for the future video about the more complex version of this up next in the show is the latest release of GNU slash Nano, which is a text editor for the terminal. It's a very simplistic text editor that doesn't have a ton of features, but it's also a text editor that is very common in basically every distribution. So if you need to edit config files and stuff like that, then this is how you would do it And in like the early stages of using Linux. There are also other terminal-based editors, but they're way more complex than Nano. And Nano is actually a topic that we covered in an episode of Destination Linux, episode 183, and we called it, It's Okay to Use Nano, because some people have, you know, different opinions of that and give a little bit of an elitism approach to, if you can't, if you're not using Nano, you're not using Linux or whatever nonsense that is. Uh, but it was just kind of funny to me that I wanted to cover Nano's latest release because they have a big 5.0 release just basically right after we covered them on uh, covered the project on the show for Destination Linux and we had no intention that that was going to be well timed but turns out it was so yeah let's get into the latest release of 5.0 the latest release have a, has a new command line parameter called dash dash indicator which shows kind of a scroll bar on the right hand side of the screen now, if you're watching the video version of the show, you will see in the video version a demonstration of the latest Nano inside of a, a, ter a terminal that shows you this kind of scroll bar thing. This is there to indicate where in the buffer the viewport is located and how much it covers. So it's essentially kind of how a scroll bar works in general, except when it says kind of a scroll bar, it means it's not really, it's not mouse reactive. So it's not exactly a scroll bar in what you expect a scroll bar to do. It's more of an indicator of where you are in the file, which is still helpful, but there you go. Just know that. They also added some new abilities to tag and untag lines with an anchor. So you can hit Alt Insert, and this will add an anchor to whatever line you are on, so that way you can jump back and forth between different anchors using Alt, Page Up, and Page Down, which allows you to really quickly navigate between uh, inside of files or like really large files through Nano, which is a pretty cool addition. They've also added some improvements to an execute command prompt that is now accessible, uh, directly accessible from the main menu, as well as the formatter, spell checker, and linter, and suspension, and all a bunch of other stuff that are now available in this menu too. Uh, they've also added syntax for Markdown, Haskell, and ADA ADA. I'm not sure if they're supposed to pronounce it that way, but uh, those were added in this latest release, which is pretty cool. And they've also done made, made it where backup files will retain their group ownership when possible in this latest release as a bunch of other stuff. So if you are not familiar with Nano and you want to see you know, the uh, latest updates, well, latest release, we'll have a link in the show notes below for 5.0. But I'll also have a link for the Destination Linux episode where we talk about Nano and why it's okay to use it. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the password manager that I use and trust, and I have been using it for quite a long time. And if you want to check it out, you can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started with your free account. And password managers are very, very important. Bitwarden is my favorite because of so many different reasons. But We'll get to that in a second. But if you're not familiar with what a password manager is, they are a great way to have a balance of security and convenience when using online accounts. So when you want to create an account on a website, you should have a different password for every single website you create an account on. And the reason is because if you share the same password for multiple sites, if any of those sites are compromised, then all of them are theoretically compromised. So if you have your bank account, you want one password and that same password with some random website, then that random website gets compromised. 
well, your bank password is not safe anymore at that point. So it's better to have a different password for every single website. And that's also complicated though. So how do you keep track of it? Password managers, they're essentially, essentially a vault that allows you to log into that vault. And that's the only thing you need to remember is how to get into the vault. And once you're in, everything else is set up for you and it will remember all that stuff for you. So you create the password, create the account, save it in your Bitwarden, and you're done. You just go back into Bitwarden whenever you need it, autofill the passwords, good to go. Such a great thing. And also, it's 100% open source software. That's right. I kind of buried the lead right there, but it's open source software, meaning they are so confident in the security of their software that they are allowing you to see the source code to make it. That is awesome. And not only that, they're confident enough in their source code that they hire third party companies to audit the security of their source code. And they have recently just announced a new, uh, a new security audit that they, they finished. And it's just so awesome to, to, be a, to have this company be sponsoring This Week in Linux because I'm such a fan of their software and the way they handle the ethics of open source software and security audits. And they even let you self-host the software too if you want to. So remember, go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started with your free account. Or you can check out their premium account, which is only starts at $10 per year. That's right. Super inexpensive, $10 per year. You get a bunch of extra awesome features. And you can do what I do, which is basically I use this. I do the premium account because it's only $10 a year. And I just appreciate all the work that they have done and the the fact that they're trusting me enough to, you know, open the source of their software and then pay for security audits and all that stuff. I mean, the least I can do is pay $10 a year for their service. So make the smart move like many from the community have and go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to get started for free. Or if you're like me, though, you'll want to show your appreciation by signing up for that premium edition, especially since the premium edition only starts at $10 a year. Thanks again to Bitwarden for sponsoring This Week in Linux and the Destination Linux Network. Up next in the show is the latest release of the Nitrix distribution of 1.3.1. This is an Ubuntu-based Linux distro that uses a 64-bit architecture, and they have a very interesting approach in a variety of ways. They use the NX desktop, which is their own desktop customization layer sitting on top of Plasma 5, and this is you can I'll have a link to the desktop pay website by itself because they allow you to use NX desktop on other places so you could download that and that kind of thing but also they have it where if you want to just try it out through Nitrix you can do that as well and actually the NX desktop is really interesting and it looks really nice in many ways I'm not a fan of the really bright windows approach but overall I think it's a really really nice looking uh, distribution and a really nice looking desktop and I think some of the ways they handle Plasma 5 is better than the way that Plasma 5 handles it. So there's that. Also, there's a really interesting thing is that they use app images as the main distribution application package for it. It's not the only thing they have, but it is a really like focal point for the distribution, which I think is very, very interesting. Uh, if you're not familiar, app images are is a universal format for applications on Linux, as along with snaps and flat packs. Uh, I'm actually gonna do a video about all three of those in the future. So if you're interested about that, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Also, uh, there's this latest release brings software updates, bug fixes, performance improvements, and improvements to uh, hardware support, to like out of the box hardware support for new devices and that kind of thing. It comes with a, a Plasma 5.19.4, which is the latest version. It also comes with the latest uh, frameworks and KDE application suite. Uh, there's a new KDE application suite coming out soon, if it hasn't already come out. No, well, it's coming out soon, yeah. Uh, but it's coming. It currently has the latest version, which is the 20.4.03. They also done some upgrades and improvements to the GTK theme. It's now closer to the Cavantum. Is it Cavantum? I don't know if it's Cavantum or Cavantum. I don't know. And the plasma color scheme, so it makes it look more like they're that more cohesive, and it looks like it fits better in their system, which is great. The ISO for the Nitrix distribution now uses LZ4 compression, which gives it faster installation times, which is really nice to see. And they've also improved the UI for the Calamari's installer by replacing it with their own QML port module called Calamari's-QML, which is pretty interesting. And if you're not aware, Nitrix is also the creators of the Maui Kit, uh, Maui Kit application 
It's uh, the universal in interface toolkit for making applications. And they uh, created, we talked about the Maui Kit project a uh, few weeks ago when it, there was a name conf uh, conflict, a name collision with Microsoft's new Maui thing. And it's essentially the same thing, but Microsoft decided they don't care that one already existed and they're going to take it. Uh, essentially, that's what happened. We talked about that. So this is the same people who made that toolkit also make NX Desktop and also make this Nitrix OS. So that's pretty cool. I wanted to talk about the latest thing because it's just a really interesting distribution because it has its own layer on top of Plasma and also does the app image stuff and they also do the Maui kit stuff. Really cool stuff. Anyway, really cool. If you want to check it out, I have a link to it in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest release of Bunsen Labs Linux Lithium release. So Bunsen Labs Linux is a successor or a continuation of the CrunchBang Linux distribution. And if you're not familiar with that, it's essentially meant to be a Debian-based distribution using OpenBox Window Manager. So this is based on, the latest version is based on Debian 10 or Debian Buster, and it has OpenBox as the window manager used. If you're not familiar with the difference between, between a desktop environment and a window manager, it's essentially a window manager is always involved in a desktop environment, but a desktop environment is a bigger wrapper that adds a lot more stuff to make it function more modern and that kind of thing. So that's that's just an over, like a thousand foot overview explanation. If you want me to be more specific, let me know. I'll make a video explaining the two different things and uh, there you go. But moving on for Bunsen Labs is a really nice version of OpenBox on Debian because if you just install OpenBox, it's not very... It's not very featureful. There's a lot of things missing, including just automatically adding apps to the main menu and also in a way kind of the main menu itself because OpenBox doesn't come with a panel and it doesn't come with the main menu. It comes with this uh, right-click menu system, which is still kind of nice and I, just, I like it. I even use it on my Plasma. I don't, I mean, I don't use OpenBox on Plasma. I use the right-click menu thing because that's cool. Um, but different topic completely, but uh, it's a very different thing. So Bunsen Labs is a much nicer, polished, modern approach to OpenBox, which I think is pretty cool. And this latest version has a new dark theme mode, which is awesome. I like that. And also they have some improvements to the Papyrus icon set that they use, which, by the way, Papyrus is a really nice icon set. If you don't use it, go check it out. It's pretty cool. And they've also done some improvements for modularity of customizations. So maybe, for example, you don't want to use Open, OpenBox and you want to replace it with another window manager. You can do that. And if you do that, they also they're, they're, the thing that they've done for their modularity is that the menu items, the key bindings, and the auto-started apps will also stay there as well as other settings that you have done, which is pretty cool. Uh, they've also added some uh, a new... A menu by default called JG menu. That's the menu they use now inside of their OpenBox setup. And they've also done some important improvements to uh, Bluetooth support and other enhancements for like their welcome script and a variety of different things. Uh, so if you're interested in checking out a, a very, very lightweight distribution based on Debian, uh, then you should definitely check out Bunsen Labs because OpenBox is a really slick window manager, but it does need a lot of polish and Bunsen Labs put that effort for polishing. So if that's the thing you're kind of you're you're interested in checking out, be sure to do that and you'll find a link in the show notes below. Up next in the show is the latest release of Gecko Linux, which is a, a derivative of OpenSUSE. And if you're not familiar, Gecko Linux is a distribution that has a couple of different options. They have a static release, a rolling release, and something called the next release. So the static release is based on OpenSUSE Leap. The rolling release is based on OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, and the open the Gecko Linux next release is based on OpenSUSE Leap, but has newer bleeding edge components, which is very interesting, and I'm not really sure how that works. But there you go, that's an option if you want to. So what makes it different from OpenSUSE based stuff is that uh, it also has a different installer. It uses Calamares instead of the Yast installer that OpenSUSE comes with. It also has support for proprietary media formats and various other multimedia apps, uh, thanks to the integration of the Pac-Man repositories. And not to be confused with Arch's Pac-Man, they're even spelled different. It's P-A-C-K-M-A-N, that's the Pac-Man for OpenSUSE, which is a third-party type of uh, repository. 
Uh, it also offers support for Google and Skype repositories out of the box with Gecko Linux and some other stuff. Uh, but uh, Gecko Linux, a couple things about this. First of all, I really like the fact that they call it static, not stable. This is a term that I have used for a very long time to try to convince people to stop calling their distribution releases stable because the word stable does not mean what people think it means in the broad sense. So if you have ever heard of a distribution like this is a stable release, that doesn't mean that they're guaranteeing stability. What it means is that it is the same concept of static as in not changing. It's a stable because it's not going to change much or at all, depending on what it is. Maybe they'll have security updates and that kind of thing, but normally it just means it won't change. So I always hated the idea that programmers and developers and distros and stuff like that call the thing stable, like Debian stable, when it doesn't mean that. I mean, technically speaking, because you don't change much, it is more stable because change implements or introduces possibilities of issues. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that. And people confuse the two. So the developers mean not changing and users just interpret it as what you would assume it meant with stability. That's not what it means. That's what static differentiates it before is because static is obviously referring to movement or lack of movement. And I like the fact that they implement that term. Now, I wish every other distribution would also implement that term, but who knows? Probably won't ever happen, but I can hope. Moving on. So Gecko Linux has static and rolling, which is based on Leap and Tumbleweed, respectively. But they also have this thing called Next, which is that combination of Leap, but also updating the latest versions of a variety of different things. So the, the rolling and the Leap have multiple different versions that you can get with different uh, desktop environment options. Like for example, there are seven different options you can get with the, the static, uh, Plasma, Gnome, XFCE, Cinnamon, etc., And also the same kind of thing with uh, Gecko, Linux, Gecko Linux rolling. But the Gecko Linux Next is a single option that allows you to have a Leap-based version of OpenSUSE that has the latest version of KDE Plasma, which is 5.19 at this time. And it updates that level framework. So the KDE stuff is updated as fast as possible. And then the OpenSUSE core stuff is based on Leap, which is 15.2 static releases. So it's a pretty interesting distribution and in how they handle everything. So if you want to check out Gecko Linux for yourself, I have links in the show notes below. But I also want to make a quick note. It's kind of weird that you when you, you download the ISOs from GitHub, but I couldn't find the names of the people who make Gecko Linux. Maybe I just didn't look hard. I couldn't. I didn't look hard enough, or whatever. I don't know, but I couldn't find any names associated to it. So that's kind of weird. I don't. I'm not saying it's sketchy or anything like that. I just thought it was kind of weird and worth pointing out that I couldn't find any names. So links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show, please smash that like button and be sure to subscribe. If you'd like to support this show and this channel, then we have multiple ways to contribute via PayPal, Patreon, sponsors, and many others. You can learn more by going to tuxdigital.com contribute. Or you can order the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt by going to destinationlinux.network store. This is a shirt that I designed to convey the message that whether or not you know that Linux is there, it probably is. That's why it has Tux blended into the background of the shirt to convey that message. Again, go to destinationlinux.network store to check it out. And we also have ways to contribute without any cost to you by using our affiliate links. You can find links for places like Amazon, Private Internet Access, Humble Bundle, and many more by going to tuxdigital.com slash affiliates. And if you'd like some more podcasting goodness from me, then check out the latest episode of Destination Linux as I'm a co-host of that show. And the latest episode, we have Let's Squash Some Bugs, where we talk about bug reporting in Linux and open source and how we can solve it. And next episode coming out is the how to fix tech support for Linux. So you want to check that one out as well, as well as the one I mentioned earlier in the show about it's okay to use Nano, which wasn't actually planned to be during the time that Nano came out with a new version, but it just happened that way. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, check it out, destinationlinux.org to ch find out more about that show, which is an awesome show. And it's not because I'm a part of it and that makes it unbiased, but I am a part of it. I am a little bit biased, but it is still awesome because yes, exactly. Anyway, 
So thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Zanell with Tux Digital and This Week in Linux. And as always, keep using, learning, and enjoying Linux. And I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux good news.